Ja, då önskar jag välkommen till uh, Nugs månatliga medlemsmöte. Jag uh, är Peter Rinnolsen och är uh, en av de som organiserar de här mötena. Uh, Efter mötet så drar vi och får oss en uh, matbit och lite att läsa med. Så jag hoppas att många som möjligt blir med oss dit. Men för den tid så ska vi höra lite om uh, hur som datamaskinen tickar och vad som är kanske inte så lurigt att tänka på om man vill ha en god natt sömn. Men i alla fall ting som är viktiga att huska på för att uh, förstå vad som är uh, stå för datamaskinen idag. Vi har fått uh, Vincent uh, <coughs> Ambu till att fortälla lite om uh, reproduktion du ser bara kompilering vill jag väl kanske kalla det mm-hmm. som ju är ett tema som har tagits upp de senaste åren. Är så god. Yep. Tusen tack. Right. Uh, the presentation will be in English because we potentially have international viewers too. Hi international viewers and hi international viewers in the audience. Um, so my name is Vincent. I uh, do functional programming and also system administration. I've been doing that for um, I don't even know quite some time now. Um, and there's a lot of things that people don't think about in programming and system administration in general uh, when it comes to what you can actually trust on your computers. I'm going to go through a few basics and then there won't be a happy ending. And please ask me questions along the way if you have any, because it's kind of difficult, you know, the curse of knowledge to figure out at what level one should talk about a topic like this. Right, um, so I got the idea for this talk last time I was at a Nuke meetup actually, which was about Purism, a company that makes um, trusted hardware devices. Uh, so they're making machines uh, that can run Linux and in the future also maybe a phone um, on, on machines that only have free software in, uh, in the firmware stack. And the idea there is that you should be able to trust what the machine itself is doing. People have probably heard of the Intel management engine and all the debacles surrounding that. Um, but the presenter who gave the last presentation said one very interesting thing at some point, which is that he was talking about the state of his personal computers. And then at some point he said, and then once I've installed my Debian on it, I can trust the machine. And I was like, uh, wait a second, because do you actually know where your Debian packages come from and what the implications of that are? And that's kind of what I want to talk about right now. Right. Um, so people sort of take this leap that they're now running a system like Linux or maybe FreeBSD or OpenBSD or whatever your flavor of uh, free software is that is fully open source and that is fully trustworthy for some reason because it is open source. Um, but the thing that people kind of leave out there is that at some point you have to go from source to the actual compiled binary that is running on your machine, right? So we have a compiler in between in most cases and that compiler also comes from somewhere and that compiler has its own source code, right? And that source code had at some point to be compiled by a compiler. So we see it sort of a turtles all the way down thing. Um, so when people say that they, for example, build Linux from scratch, there's this popular Linux from scratch.com or .org tutorial about how to set up your own uh, kernel with everything on top. And then they say, I've built my OS from scratch. But that isn't actually true, because at some point you had binaries come in and compile some of the things that you wanted to compile. So let's take a look at that. Um, Compiling a compiler is a sort of chicken and egg problem, you know, because uh, we have GCC, the most uh, popular compiler, the GNU C compiler, or rather the GNU C compiler tool suite, because it covers the whole C family. And guess what that is written in? C. So what do you need to compile a C compiler? A C compiler. Yeah. Uh, there probably are C compilers written in Java, actually. So. Um, the thing that happens in the GCC family and also with related compilers such as Clang, the LLVM C compiler, and probably also in Microsoft land, but I don't really have any perspective on that, um, is that the C family compilers bootstrap themselves. So you use GCC to compile GCC, and partially, in, if you're lucky, they can bootstrap each other. Um, so we have um, GCC before version 4.7, which was actually written in C, in proper standard C, and which could be compiled with a C compiler that followed the standards accordingly. Um, after 4.7, they decided to start introducing C++ into the code base, and then things kind of went downhill. But uh, fortunately, the, if you have a valid GCC 4.7 compiler, you can compile the chain all the way up. You can compile 4.8, 4.9, and then 5, and so on, uh, all the way to today's, I think, 6 or 7 is what we're at in the major version. Um, 
Clang, because it's relatively new, uh, the compiler that originated out of Apple's LLVM project, is actually able to be compiled by GCC and also by Microsoft C compiler, so that has multiple viable bootstrap paths, as we call them. Um, one, one family of languages that is very interesting from a bootstrapping perspective is Common Lisp. Um, Common Lisp is a family of languages that has had an ANSI standard since the 70s or 80s, roughly. And uh, a lot of compilers have been implemented for Common Lisp over the years. And some of those are written in Common Lisp. But the interesting thing is that we have a sort of compiler diversity uh, of compilers that can compile each other, which will become relevant in the next slides, which makes this process slightly easier. Uh, the other interesting thing there is we will go into reproducibility uh, in this talk later. If you don't know what that means right now, uh, don't worry, I'll explain it. Um, and Common Lisp's uh, Steel Bank Common Lisp compiler was one of the first compilers to be fully reproducible in 2004, which is uh, slightly hipster in some ways. Right. We have, as a modern example, the opposite of the other two, Rust-C, uh, the main compiler for the Rust language that Mozilla developed which is bootstrapped with a previous version of itself always. So the build process is basically multi-staged, and the first stage is that it downloads a release of its previous version and then compiles itself from there. Um, they actually bootstrapped that originally not from C, which is kind of a common path for languages to evolve uh, when, they, when they become self-hosted, which means that they compile themselves. Uh, they wrote the original Rust-C compiler in OCaml, and then you need an OCaml compiler, which is written in C, and then you need an OCaml runtime, which is also written in C. So they have a lot of legacy baggage, which they kind of dropped at some point. Right, and the same thing applies to many other languages too. Um, a notable counterexample of a language that doesn't actually compile itself is Clojure, uh, the modern Lisp dialect on the JVM, which is fully written in Java. And um, when it comes to other languages, it kind of depends because uh, some of the popular scripting languages like Perl also have multiple implementations and it depends on the implementation. So that's the compiler side of things. I briefly mentioned runtimes. Um, that's the other thing. Yeah, we have a sort of uh, triangle of things that are problematic. We have chickens and eggs and lizards, as I put it in the slide title. Um, we have the JVM, uh, which is the actual virtual machine on which we execute Java code. And then we have the Java compiler as a separate thing. There are Java compilers written in Java that can give us Java bytecode, but we still need to run them on a VM. And the VM is, again, written in C++. So we have, a, again, a multi-layered bootstrap path here. Uh, Erlang's VM, the, the Beam VM, the, I think, Björn Erik Anders uh, virtual machine, is written in C. The Haskell runtime is written in C. And many other languages that have a runtime are also written in C. I think one of the most popular Perl 6 implementations is uh, a JVM one, if I'm not. Okay, so there again we have the sort of diversity of runtimes which are not written in the language itself. So we basically have to fundamentally accept no matter what we do, we will never get away from C here. Even if you're using higher level languages and you have a super clean compiler, you still have a runtime. And that is going to be dirty. So the interesting question here is this. Can anybody guess? Yes, um, short spoiler. So people don't think so much about where the compiler comes from, right? You install Debian, and you install the GCC package, and the base devil packages, and it comes from somewhere in the void. And that was compiled with some other compiler that came from somewhere in the void. And we probably don't really care, because we have our own source code that we're compiling with this, and GCC doesn't know about that, right? So why would it matter? Um, unfortunately, the real world isn't quite that easy. And people discovered this quite a long time ago. And I'll just quickly walk through that. So before I get to the actual potential attack that is sort of the main topic of this talk, I have to do a short interlude um, about something called a quine. Uh, a quine is a program that when you put it into, uh, into any kind of language, it will output its own source code one-to-one. -one. Um, so if you take this snippet over here and you dump it into, if you dump that into a Lisp REPL like this one, the output that we get is Formatted slightly differently. Uh, I'm going to make this one bigger. Formatted slightly differently, but it is exactly the same thing that I put in at the beginning. So this program just reproduced itself. It doesn't matter so much how this one works, and this one isn't very interesting in general, but I just want to demonstrate the basic concept here. Um, so 
there are a bunch of classic quines written in C and other languages like that, but mostly they're sort of to be considered like art projects uh, that are focusing on reproducing itself for the sake of doing that. Uh, the interesting question that comes in is, can you make them reproduce their own source code, but also make them do something in addition to that? And here's a little program called the Quine Relay. Um, I wanted to demonstrate this, uh, but it's sort of difficult to set up, and I'll get to why at the end of the talk. Um, but this is a program written in everything, in 128 languages, and you can take the source code, and then you can go in this circle of languages. So you run it in, let's say, F-sharp, and it outputs valid false source code, and you can run it through a false interpreter, and it outputs flex, outputs fish shell, and so on. And you can go all the way around in this program. Um, that's definitely an art project, but it's a very cool demo of this concept of uh, being able to do something else in your Quine other than just reproducing your own output. Um, also, the, the source code of this for additional fun is this logo um, in, in ASCII text. It's, it's kind of cool. They put a lot of work into that. <laughs> right. Um, side note, also, this program is actually extremely trustworthy. This is one of the few programs I would trust because it goes through so many different languages that it's very unlikely that someone has managed to find an exploit that does something malicious that propagates all the way around the circle. Um, especially when you get to weird things, there's PostScript in here somewhere, and uh, I find it unlikely that that is um, a problem. Right, so if we put these components together, we can, have, we, we can have a program that reproduces itself, but it can also do something interesting in addition. Then we get this thing called the trusting trust attack that uh, Ken Thompson described in 1983 when he received his Turing Award. Ken Thompson, for those uh, who don't know, is um, the, one of the main designers of Unix and also the person who is unfortunately responsible for the Go language, at least partially. Um, and what he did in his talk is that he introduced a program that reproduced its own source code, as we've demonstrated. And then he introduced a program, a, a modification to a compiler that can detect when the compiler is compiling a compiler. Following me? And then he made a modification of that that could insert the source code of this modification into the newly compiled compiler. So we sort of get a situation where we have um, a GCC that has been compiled by a malicious version of our source code, and we run it on the GCC source code that is clean, it does not contain this modification, and the original uh, malicious GCC will detect what it's doing right now and insert this malicious code into the compiler again, without the person who has the full source code of the program ever seeing it anywhere, and it will be in the output again. Um, Ken Thompson actually described this as sort of uh, the thing that is the closest to evolution he has ever seen in computing, which I found an interesting uh, side note. So we can do that, and uh, this was actually demonstrated by him too, uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, but the question is, what can we actually do with this kind of uh, attack? And he demonstrated, he demonstrated an attack uh, using this that would extend the original detect, uh, detecting code to figure out when it's compiling the login command on Linux. And then it would simply take any string that was supplied by the user as a password, and before doing the PAM lookup, it would instead uh, also allow a static string that he had hard-coded in the, in the compiler exploit. So if you took the clean, unmodified, uh, login.c source code and you ran it through GCC, you would get a malicious login binary out that would accept your hard-coded password. Um, and the interesting thing here is if he, if he had managed to distribute a GCC, um, a binary GCC with this exploit in it, this would not show up anywhere because it's not in the source code of any of the programs anymore. And it lives on through this perpetual cycle of compilers compiling themselves. So, um, one of the interesting things about this is that no one knows when we compile the GCC from full source, so basically from assembly level all the way up uh, to a running GCC the last time, probably a long time ago, multiple decades. The first C compilers were written in B, which is the preceding language, which was also made by Ken Thompson, by the way. And there was a sort of evolution and uh, dirty hacking at the beginning. It's not like it's any different today. Um, that, that led to us just not being able to, to get literally the hardware that could run this old code and bootstrap all the way up again. Uh, so we have, a, we have a slight problem there, because in theory, any GCC you have right now could 
contain some kind of exploit that we don't know about, and it would be very, very difficult for us to figure out that this is the case. So, damage potential in, in addition to this little um, login uh, exploit that I just mentioned would, for example, be, and this is one of the ones that is commonly theorized as an actual exploit that people may potentially be doing, is detecting a cryptographic code, so like the compilation of OpenSSL, for example, and inserting weaknesses into the crypto algorithms, uh, which would lead to the person that has distributed your compiler basically backdooring your crypto without you ever noticing, because your OpenSSL source code is clean. Um, Another thing is that compilers get more complicated. I mentioned that GCC moved from just being C to being C++ and also compiling like a whole family of languages, which means that the source code of that is so large and not known by any single person that it would be relatively easy to add an exploit somewhere that would take a long time to be found. So yeah, you can probably think of more potential exploits, um, but these are like the common ones that people talk about. So people also, of course, think about what countermeasures we can apply to get around this. Um, and in an ideal world, we would just be able to take a, you know, take a piece of hardware that can run code, and then we could compile all the way up until we have a working GCC. But unfortunately, we can't do that. Um, so I'm going to quickly talk about a technique called diverse double compiling. Um, this is actually, it, it sounds relatively simple to do. Um, but it's difficult to understand exactly which guarantees you get out of this. So please ask me if you have any questions under the way. So assume we have um, some kind of target language, say C, and we have two compilers for this target language. Let's call them A and T. And we have the source code of compiler A. And we want a clean build of compiler A. So we want to make a build of A that we are relatively certain does not contain any backdoored code. And we call the source code S of A. Then what we do in uh, diverse double compiling to defend against this attack is that we create two different stages of build outputs. The first one we have, say, X and Y, the names are arbitrary, where we first apply the compiler A to the source code, and we apply the compiler T to the source code. And we get two different compilers out, right? And technically, they're the same program, right? They should have the same, um, they should do the same thing, which we call functional equivalence. Uh, does this make sense? Yes, I see some slightly confused faces. Um, we have functional equivalence, but not necessarily binary equivalence, because maybe this one compiler runs on the JVM and it gave us Java output or whatever, and the other one is, uh, is a C compiler that gave us machine code. But we have two programs that technically should be doing the same thing. And now we apply the second stage. So we take these two compilers that came out of here, and we apply them again uh, to the same source code. And now we get V and W out of there, which in theory, assuming that this build is reproducible, um, should be bit for bit equivalent. So the compilers that we got out of here do exactly the same thing, even if the, if the runtime artifact is different. And the compilers here that come out should be exactly the same thing. Um, the problem here is, there's, there's actually multiple problems. Uh, the first one is, of course, reproducibility. We can't actually guarantee that this output is going to be bit for bit the same for various reasons that I'll get into in the next slide. And also, um, we can't actually defend against both of these compilers being backdoored. So if, if you have um, a backdoor in a compiler that is clever enough to detect two different compilers being compiled, itself and another one, uh, then that backdoor could potentially survive multiple of these steps. And you have to basically just make more of these. You throw more compilers at the problem. You throw GCC on different architectures, cross-compiling, and you use CLang and maybe the Microsoft compiler if you feel like it, and make this list as long as possible. And what happens is that the difficulty of attacking this path grows exponentially. Um, but we can never, like assuming there's some sort of omnipotent coder somewhere out there in China, um, we cannot know that this is 100% secure. We can only be reasonably sure if we get the same output here that we probably have a thing we can rely on. Um, this technique is actually done. This is not just a theoretical thing. People do this, people have automated this. They have like large matrices of GCCs compiling each other to figure out if things are fine. And for the most part, it looks like things are fine, but we just have to keep in the back of our heads that this is theoretically possible. Okay, questions? Nope. Reproducibility. So 
In the last step of that, we should get two artifacts out, and they should be byte for byte the same, because the program got the same inputs, right? We gave it some source code, and we were like, make us a binary out of this. Unfortunately, again, that's not how computers work most of the time. There's a, a lot of reasons. I only put four of the main ones on the slide here um, that can make this fail. And one of the most common ones is actually timestamps in output artifacts. So a compiler that's compiling some source code and for some reason decides that the user should have a timestamp in the output binary telling him or her when it was compiled. Um, another classic example of that is Java compilers creating jars because jars are zip files and zip files have metadata that is also timestamps and then yeah, things are dependent on when you build it. Um, we have non-deterministic linking order. That one is fun. Uh, we actually had an issue related to that in a Rust build recently. Um, so if you have a compiler that compiles multiple parts of your program in parallel, then you may get multiple object outputs in parallel in an, basically a non-deterministic order based on how the CPU uh, was scheduling your work. And the interesting thing here is that in some implementations it will then take the object files and link them together in the order that they came out of the build, which may be non-deterministic. So this one is also easy to defend against. Here we can pin the time. Here we can disable parallel builds. Um, but then it gets even more complicated. So uh, Lisp likes doing this, which is that you, you uh, load up an application into a running system, and you dump the entire memory state of the system into a file. Um, and then you just ship that file. That's your executable. There you go. Very good. The problem is, uh, memory states in VMs are kind of complicated and based on how long it took you to type it in or maybe um, where the files were located on your disk, you may end up having issues uh, with this not being reproducible either. And then the last one, and this one is one that actually makes me kind of angry, is that sometimes developers uh, choose to introduce randomness into their builds. Um, the most ridiculous example of this I've seen is uh, NACL, a crypto library that um, upon building runs a benchmark test suite. So it, it, let, let's say you're compiling NACL on your machine. It will compile NACL 20 or so times with different build flags, different compiler flags, and then it will run a benchmark suite over all the output artifacts and give you the fastest one. And the thing is, that may not necessarily be the same, again, dependent on the workload of your machine, CPU scheduling, and so on. So that is kind of crazy. Fortunately, there is a fork of NACL called Libsodium that removes this um, build process. So yeah, non-determinism, as we call this, uh, so not being able to uh, get the same output for the same input is the devil, and keep that in mind when you're writing programs. So where are we actually at? Um, yeah, this, this, this one is some, uh, a thing I should highlight briefly. Uh, without reproducibility, we cannot ever trust that the package we install from, for example, a Debian repository actually matches the source input given. In an ideal world, we would be able to go to the project's website and the author would say, if you have this source code, then your binary will have this SHA hash. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that. So right now you're sort of also in the Debian case trusting this web of developers doing the right thing. Um, right, so let's look at the state of the union. I've picked out two distributions, um, Debian and NixOS, um, to look at how they do, how they deal with the bootstrap issue, which is how do we get from nothing to having a compiler and a working distribution? And how they do on reproducibility. And spoiler alert, not well, uh, neither of them, unfortunately. So here's the desired state. Uh, full source bootstrap. We have no binaries at all. We have a computer. We take our source code, and in some way, we put it into the computer, and out comes Debian or NixOS. Um, that's a slight oversimplification, but uh, it would be nice to be able to achieve that. The second one is all packages are fully reproducible for the same set of source inputs. We always get byte for byte identical uh, packages out of the thing. Right. Um, here's where we're at. Debian. So I tried to figure out how Debian is bootstrapped. Um, and I was slightly surprised that this isn't really discussed much in the Debian community, at least not as much as reproducible builds, which we'll get to in a second. And uh, they have very sparse information on their wiki pages about how the bootstrapping process in theory is supposed to work. So the things that come up in Debian is, let's say, uh, a new processor architecture becomes popular, like ARM back in the day. Um, uh, 
and they have to, for the first time, release Debian for that new processor architecture. What they usually end up doing is they take GCC on an existing AMD64 machine, for example, and they cross-compile the compiler uh, onto the ARM architecture, and then they copy over their binary and start bootstrapping the rest from there, which is from there and it gets easy, because now you have a C compiler. Um, but they don't seem to be concerned with where the original C compiler comes from, and they never re-bootstrap, let's say, AMD64 uh, or other architectures that are commonly in use, because you know we have working compilers for that, why bother? Um, so the way that a GCC build works in Debian is that the build instructions simply depend on GCC. So you have this sort of recursive dependency, and, G uh, and Debian can figure it out because it has a concept of versions, you know, so you define a package with a newer version, a newer GCC, and then we can just use an existing older GCC and go from there. So we use whatever is in the repositories and just go. Um, it's the state of bootstrapping for Debian, unfortunately not good. Um, yeah. Reproducing Debian, on the other hand, this one is very interesting um, because Debian is one of the main organizations behind the Reproducible Builds initiative. Um, they have very organized information about uh, which packages are reproducible. I'll show you that in a second, uh, because that is also a thing you can easily help out with if you have too much free time. Um, and they actually have achieved over 90% reproducibility in their package base, which is pretty good. Right, so let's take a short look at that. This here is Debian's reproducibility graph um, from the latest stretch builds. This is run like once a day on the entire package set that they have. Um, and all this green over here, this one on the side is the newest one, are packages that reproduce fully. This is tested by building them multiple times under multiple conditions and checking whether the outputs match. And um, then there are things that are not reproducible and things that have minor issues and so on. And the interesting thing here is that we can, da -da -da, I'm going to steal this window briefly. <laughs> Any Debian users in the audience? What's the package you use? What's a package you use? VLC. VLC, right. Let me see. Um, and back here. So here's all the current packages. I'm going to search for VLC in here. And there it is. Click. And there we go. VLC is, what is it? Not reproducible. And here are the issues that are currently uh, in existence in the VLC build. So um, C preprocessor macros are capturing current timestamps. I've mentioned this one as a classic. Um, file permissions vary in the outputs. Uh, tarballs capture user groups and local user IDs. All, those are all the kinds of things that we commonly have to deal with when we're trying to make builds reproducible. But none of these are particularly hard to fix, is what the Debian project has found out uh, over time. These are just things that people don't initially think of when they're making uh, a package or writing a program, and then years down the line, someone actually starts caring about this and we get this kind of situation. So one of the easy things you can do um, while you're sitting in a lunch meeting uh, with your laptop out is you go to this website, uh, the Reproducible Builds website for Debian, and I can put the URL somewhere later on, and then you uh, pick a package that you use and check what's not reproducible in it and just fix it. Because usually the fixes are kind of easy to do and there's a wiki documenting all the common fixes for all the common packages. Someone just has to go and actually do it. Right, um, that's that. Du, 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 du. Um, yeah, should also mention that Debian is fundamentally still a binary distribution, which means that um, when you install Debian and you install Debian packages, you have a list of all the packages in their repositories, and when you're installing something, you're asking for a specific binary package. And then that gets downloaded and installed on your machine. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. So I'm going to introduce a piece of cool old technology um, called Nix. There's actually been talk about Nix at Nuke before, before I started using Nix, uh, which was interesting. Um, but that focused mostly on a specific component of Nix. I'm going to just give you an overview over another component of it. So Nix is uh, a purely functional programming um, uh, package manager. I was going to say programming language because that is the term that people commonly say. Um, it's not a new project. It's a little over 10 years old, 10, 12 years, something like that. Um, 
but it's had a very slow ramp up to actually being usable. Um, and the main idea of Nix is that instead of describing how to build a thing, you describe what the thing that you want built is. So I made a meme for this, couldn't resist, um, with the thing we don't want to do, which is uh, write instructions that say we have to first install GCC, and then we have to have the source code of the program, and then we run GCC on the source code of this program, and then we get something out. That's not good. What we instead want, and I'll explain why in a second, is we want to be able to say something like, core utils is the result of applying GCC to its source code. Um, this is a subtle difference, and it may take a moment to wrap your head around, uh, but it's also a very important difference, because uh, out of this come a few other pieces of information. For example, in here we have a system on which we install a compiler, and then we, install, uh, then we use the compiler to build the thing we want, but we really only want the thing we want. But now we have a compiler, we don't need that. Um, whereas down here, um, the output that we get, the core utils, no longer needs the GCC on the system, which we have captured in the information that we wrote down for the computer. So what Nix does is it pins all the inputs that come from the outside of the Nix universe, so any tarball you download, any Git repository you clone, anything like that uh, with a full hash so that no one can like, go in and replace a tarball and give you something other than what you expected. And then it takes all the build inputs as the user described them and it performs a build of whatever package you're building in a sandbox, um, which means that it, it sets the clock to the 1st of January 1970, it hides the rest of the file system from the user and only puts the things that you specified on the path, and it does a bunch of other slightly hacky magic to make a fully repeatable environments possible. Um, what ends up happening is that it's a pain to write Nix packages sometimes, um, because there's a lot of build systems that want to download things off the internet randomly, and Nix doesn't like that. Uh, but once you manage to do it, you have a, basically one single hash, which is the hash of all of your inputs that refers to a specific build artifact. Um, I'm going to demonstrate one tiny little thing about Nix. Yeah, here we have a Nix repo. So, um, a thing that is slightly unusual about Nix is that it doesn't install files in the way something like Debian would do. If you install GCC on Debian, it's going to get installed physically in slash user slash bin slash GCC, and the file is going to be there. It's not what Nix does. It sets up a so-called symlink forest. So there's a folder at the root of your file system called slash Nix slash store, and inside of that Nix store are all the packages that you've installed on your system with a hash dash name, and inside of that every package is uniquely sandboxed. And then this, the package that is actually on your system in slash user slash bin slash GCC is a sim link to that package. Um, this has the interesting effect that uh, everything that is linked in Nix, so any dynamically linked library, and everything that is executed from a shell script or whatever is referred to by a full path. So if we're assuming, this isn't actually a shell script, but if this was a, a shell script, um, in which I were to invoke bash, which is kind of redundant because we're already in a shell script, but just in theory. And I would pass it some kind of command like, oh, echo hello world, hello nuke actually, for the occasion. Um, once we run this through Nix, our output is going to look slightly different. And instead of, instead of saying uh, slash user bin bash or something, we get this crazy path out here, which is in slash nix slash store, and then the hash of all inputs, and then uh, bin bash. And that refers to a specific version of this, uh, of this package and all of its inputs, which makes it very difficult um, to accidentally refer to an incorrect version or something that was built from sources that you didn't want. So that was a, so a short uh, side trip, but I needed that information in you before we continue. Um, yeah. I looked at the same questions as I looked at for Debian for NixOS, which is the Nix uh, system distribution. It's basically a Linux distribution that uses only the Nix package manager. It's actually what's running on this computer, and I would recommend everybody to check it out. Um, and this is what they do. In Nix, when you're invoking GCC, you would do what I just did in this little demonstration, and basically in your shell script write $GCC, referring to the Nix uh, GCC that's in scope, and then slash bin slash GCC and then invoke the rest of your commands. 
The problem is, if the thing that you are building right now is GCC, then you can't refer to itself. Nix considers that infinite recursion, so it stops there and doesn't let you do that. You can't simply do the Debian thing and depend on the previous GCC. Unfortunately, the Nix people also don't have a clean solution to this, uh, so what they ended up doing is they have something called Bootstrap Tools, that is a tarball stored on their website that someone built at some point and uploaded. And, um, in the GCC build, it just specifies this tarball as an input and goes from there. The only advantage we have here over Debian is really that we can actually trace where that bootstrap tarball came from because it was also built with Nix and then we can sort of manually unroll this loop because we have all the hashes. But we still have an unfortunate magic binary blob. Someone inserted that sideways into this bootstrap process and it's just how it is. Um, yeah, we also have Reproducibility in NixOS, um, which is sort of attacked from a slightly different angle as it is in Debian. They don't port any of the patches that Debian does locally in their package base. Um, they, they only take the upstream sources and run with them. However, they have this concept of fully repeatable builds. Um, repeatable and reproducible often get confused. Repeatable in this case means that the environment in which the build is performed is sandboxed and guaranteed to be identical to the last time we ran this build. Um, so, even if there are timestamps or something in the output artifact, we still know that no new sources or some system configuration or whatever has entered the build process. We can be reasonably sure that this is going to be the same thing, uh, even if, if it's not bit for bit identical. Um, yeah, hope is not lost for the bootstrapping process on Nix, uh, and also not for uh, adopting the reproducibility patches from Debian, but Nix is a much smaller project than Debian, so it's unlikely to be happening anytime soon. Yes, right. Um, one more interesting thing to mention here is that um, due to the way Nix packages refer to each other, you get a sort of tree where you have GCC at the top and then you have various libraries depending on GCC and then you have user applications depending on various libraries and so on. And we have full hashes that go all the way through here. So if someone were to maliciously change the GCC at the top, this bootstrap table, and uh, point your Nix uh, repository, your Nix channel at the wrong thing that has malicious code, you would notice very immediately because it would literally rebuild every single package on your system as the hashes wouldn't match anymore and that tends to take a while, so um, yes. Right, future development. Um, there are several projects underway uh, aiming to improve both reproducibility and the bootstrapping issue. I'm going to show some that um, are focusing on the bootstrapping issue because those are the more interesting ones. Uh, but reproducibility are the ones that are easier to contribute to, so keep that in mind. Um, yes, so there's something called stage zero. Um, the description hand-rolled Cthulhu's path to madness is from the readme of the project. It's not something I came up with. Uh, and it's literally handwritten programs in hex. So if you open the program, it's a minimal uh, hex syntax that is directly an ELF executable. And it starts off with basically the ELF magic number and then a comment saying ELF magic number and then, then you know where this is going. Um, so the, the idea there is that they perform a bootstrap from nothing to working system by having a minimal VM uh, able to interpret some, um, some, some type of uh, uh, instruction set and then they hand enter the instruction set, which is currently 80,000 characters or something like that, into the thing, and then they get the first stage from where on they can start entering hex code directly and then build up binaries. Um, the idea is that these should all be under, I think, one kilobyte, and they should be auditable by any programmer familiar with this type of uh, code. Um, not any, I think the readme, yeah, it says 70% of programmers, and they also consider the project failed if they can't get 10 random developers and seven out of them understand what's going on there. I don't think they're quite achieving this one at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I had a little look at the source code. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, the end goal of this is having a full source bootstrap, of course, for GCC, because GCC is really the, the core thing here that we need to break the loop for. Um, yeah, the problem is that this doesn't go very far right now. If you if you bootstrap stage zero, then at the end you have a slightly more intelligent uh, hex editor that can expand macros. Um, but but you really need slightly more than that to compile C code. 
That's where MES comes in, the Maxwell Equations of Software, uh, which is named after something that Alan Key said in 2003 or 2002, um, where he said that once you have Lisp, you have all of computing, like all of, uh, all of the primitives that exist in basically any, any way we represent the logic of programs can be written in a simple Lisp dialect. So the idea is that uh, once we have this, this macro, uh, ma macro expander from the previous step, from stage zero, we want to bootstrap a scheme, which is a type of Lisp, on this macro assembler to be able to go from there and write a compiler in a slightly higher level language. So the status of MES is that they have written a C compiler in Scheme, um, and that actually works. It's able to compile tiny CC, which is a C compiler that can compile GCC. Um, it's just that the binary is currently sec fault, but uh, it <laughs> 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 but it's getting there. Um, and this, they have a minimal Scheme interpreter that they run this on, which is currently written in C, just because. Um, Writing that part in the uh, hex macro expander is probably the least fun part of this project, so they are putting it off all the way until the end. But um, the people running this seem very determined, and I'm pretty sure that they're going to get there eventually. And the end goal here is a full source bootstrap of not just GCC, but uh, something called Gwix SD, um, which is the Free Software Foundation's fork of NixOS. Um, it's slightly different from Nix in that they don't use Nix, the language. Nix comes with its own programming language that is slightly surreal to work with occasionally. It was made by academics. Um, and instead, they're using a relatively trivial Lisp dialect called Guile, uh, which is the GNU extension language. And uh, GwixSD is interested in uh, officially sort of supporting the stage zero and the MAS project to get all the way to a working bootstrap path from nothing. Um, GwixSD is cool, and I also recommend people to check it out. The problem is that it's not really real-world usable, um, because they have opted for things such as not having systemd, because systemd doesn't run on the GNU herd. Um, there's a lot of things that don't run on the GNU herd, and <laughs> I don't think that's stopped anyone else so far. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's the state of that. Um, for other platforms, things are looking kind of grim. Uh, Nix for Darwin gets a sort of Honor shout out uh, that's the part of the Nix package manager to macOS for people who for some reason are stuck on macOS. Looking at you, Chris. Um, and uh, the thing that you can do there is basically uh, repeatably and almost reproducibly get a user space working on macOS. Um, but you still have you know macOS under there, which is fully proprietary closed source stuff, so don't trust any of that anyways. Um, we have, on, on the phone side of things, forget about iOS, of course. Uh, uh, on the Android side, we have something called F-Droid. That's a repository for open source Android applications. And they actually aim to have reproducible builds um, for, for all of their APKs. The problem there is that uh, you still have the base Android system. And there you have all the same issues, again, that exist in all the other distributions. And other than that, everything else mobile device-wise is currently a lost cause. Um, there is some hope that Purism, uh, the people that talked here last time, are going to succeed with their mobile phone plan. Um, they, they had a successful Kickstarter project. Um, but I'm slightly skeptical about the UI and UX components of that. We'll see how it turns out, but there is there's at least some light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, And of course, final note about this topic. Uh, closed source software and proprietary software is not trustworthy ever. Period. You cannot trust Windows and other systems like that. Right. Uh, resources you should check out, bootstrappable.org. They have uh, links to MES and stage zero and a very exhaustive wiki about the state of things right now. And reproduciblebuilds.org, which has an overview over the status of yeah, that. And that also links to the Debian reproducible builds page that I showed you earlier. Um, here's my contact details. My uh, GitHub has the same name, and the presentation slides and so on are on GitHub, and they're built reproducibly using Nix and LaTeX. So check that out if you want to do that. And thanks. <laughs> right. Questions? Hi. Uh, you're focusing a lot on the, the software that's running on the computers, but initially you mentioned the hardware as well. Yep. So, so for me, uh, that, that's sort of the 
again, next step. So how can you trust the hardware that you're using to verify all the reproducible builds? Yeah, um, short answer, you can't. Um, <laughs> what the stage zero people are doing is they've implemented a very minimal VM uh, to, to get out of the bootstrap cycle at the beginning, but then you could theoretically pose uh, a scenario in which someone has manipulated GCC compiling their VM and so on, and then you're in hell again. Um, when it comes to fully open firmware and reproducible firmware, I don't think reproducible firmware is something people talk about at all. Then you basically have to go full Richard Stallman and use some kind of computer from the early 2000s with a lot of custom modifications to be able to survive. You can also go for purism, but there's still some asterisks attached there. Um, so don't trust anything. Yeah, exactly. So that's the point. Even though if you have something that's completely repro reproducible on your computer, it's still yep. not. Yep. Yeah. And the la last thing, uh, this is my uh, call it ignorance or stupidity, but uh, how how is the use of call it decompilers in this space and the use of mm. that? Um, yeah. There are, there are. What's it called? There's something called the International C Obfuscation Contest, or something like that, um, which is focused on letting people write source code that looks very trivial on the surface. It's like, uh, oh, we are opening a file descriptor and we are writing the word chicken into the file descriptor, but really it's like changing your root password and uploading your home folder somewhere else. Um, and that is very difficult sometimes to trace out of that source code. So if we are assuming a well-engineered attack, and we're manually disassembling uh, the output binary, then we have both complexity issues because these binaries are very large. And even if we manage to trace what the person wrote originally, we may not be able to actually see what they are hiding in there. So it's, you can never 100% trust any yeah, of those things. Yeah, more about that. If you have a, a, a source code that you created mm -hmm. and you compile it with, uh, say, 10 Ooh, different kinds of compilers, mm -hmm. and then you decompile them with 10 different kinds of de decompilers on each of them, yeah. then, of course, assuming that the decompiler itself wasn't compiled with the compiler, which is malicious and knew that it was a decompiler, it was a compiling. It sort of yeah. goes back <laughs> to do, 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 do. this. Um, and th the problem there is that if the thing you're compiling is not a compiler that you're then using for another stage, then you never get to the bit-for-bit -bit equivalent. Uh, because the problem up here with functional equivalence is that the different compilers you used probably have different runtimes, and they probably have different optimizations, and they generate machine code differently. So you, you can't really expect those to be the same anyways, unfortunately. The decompiled? There's few languages that are like reliably decompilable. Uh, I guess Java is kind of close. Um, but also, if you, if you wrote a program in Scala and disassembled it as Java, then you would get some interesting results out of there. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure any of those parts are really trustworthy either. And anyway, it's the hardware is not trustworthy anyway. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, yes. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Hmm. I'm sitting here thinking right now. I mean, I've been thinking about this before, but I've never actually done something mm -hmm. uh, on it. But uh, right now, I'm uh, wondering, when you're talking about trusting hardware, uh, have anyone been thinking about doing some kind of quasi-randomization attack, uh, or uh, not, not attack, but uh, like uh, uh, to make it really, really hard for any potential hardware? You would, uh, you could do uh, quasi-randomization and basically generate so much complexity uh, in the compiler that it would be impossible for the hardware to handle all those routes. Basically doing this on a, mm. uh, on an expanded level, but using math to... Uh I think the, the attacks that people are worried about with hardware are sometimes at a slightly different level that is very difficult to defend against. So if you look at something like the Intel Management Engine, which also has access to input and output ports of your computers, and you may be facing something as simple as the hardware without your software ever even being involved uh, reading your USB output stream and sending it somewhere else. So it it's sort of depends on what you want to trust. But with the specific uh, idea you mentioned, I'm not sure if anyone is looking into that. <laughs>
cool. Um, and thank you for coming. Go home, install Nix, fix some reproducible builds, and yeah, thanks. <laughs>